the vision for the project is to improve the level of data literacy of, of the construction industry. And of course, you know, talking with BRE and Space Syntax, that seems quite yeah. easy. You know, actually, not an easy job because you really know. But since we also want to help all the pockets, niches and segments in our supply chain, it becomes quite a daunting mm -hmm. um, exercise. Um, we want to do that because we, part of our mission is to pursue innovation in the construction sector. Um, and one of the ways that we started thinking about um, would be to use open data assets and develop and, and kind of support uh, the creation of a construction specific developers community. So in a way similar to what happened to um, civic hacking in the kind of open government movement, um, you know, unleash uh, data sets uh, mm -hmm. which hopefully will be uh, open, machine readable um, and complete. And then engage with a um, you know, community of people can help us. Um, now, part of the issue I see in that is how do we get together, you know, the supply chain, the, the, the you know, small and medium SMEs and the developers, because they've never met each other. But that's an interesting, you know, challenge, we think. Uh, so we're going to start with the vision. Um, depending on time, I may ask you to comment on that or not. Uh, and then it's a very simple uh, four steps um, conversation. We'll start with the opportunities. So where do you think growth would be generated uh, by trying to produce this um, construction specific developers community? Um, and how do you think transparency will improve uh, the image of our industry? The reason why we, we touch on the image of our industry is because we are responding to the government 2025 report. Um, and you know, in that document, it's very clearly specified that in order to retain the talent, in order to uh, bridge the skills gap that you know, we are facing in the next 25 years, we need to change our industry. And we just ran a, a quite an interesting event at the RIBA a couple of weeks ago on this. Um, so these somehow had the opportunities. Uh, we will then move on to the risks. And as, as um, constructing excellence, one of the uh, campaign that we've been championing for for the last you know, 30 years is collaboration. And, and one of the you know, great hurdles for, the, for our sector um, to grow is diversity and fragmentation. And there is, there is a risk um, in having standalone, specifically developed application that that fragmentation might even grow. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just kind of, um, you know, since you've been working with data for, for um, incredible amount of time with incredible results, comment on this. So, you know, what do we need, what, what kind of enabler do we need to put in place to ensure that open data opens up the conversation, improve collaboration, rather than, you know, create a silo kind of mentality in this respect. Um, we will then kind of move high level, trying to start a conversation on the specific elements of, of the creation of an open data uh, development um, attitude and you know it, I don't know if we could but it would be great if we could give some example of how a systemic approach um, to complex issues as you know urban planning give us as you know building sites give us and how a systemic approach is the first step towards a kind of multi-layered understanding of issues um, you know from which from the understanding of which we can then develop a a new app, and a new system, a, a new uh, product. Um, and this is where I would ask BRE and Space Syntax to tell us about their experience, because you know you guys are measurable, uh, data-driven, um, you know, va value enablers and value creators, um, and we need more of that in order to unleash that you know, uh, additional transparency in order to change the image of our industry. You know, we need to be more transparent and we need to measure uh, the value we create. The last bit, it becomes really quite operational. We're talking about measuring and monitoring. Um, and then we will touch on, and again, this is your experience, um, how measuring and monitoring have changed, for instance, in the last 20 years. Uh, how you know field activity is no longer that necessary as it used to be. I uh, remember your work on Trafalgar Square. Was yeah, 
quite yeah. quite or something maybe it that. still is oh, oh yeah or maybe yeah. it still is it would be it would be great to challenge kind of you know um collective and uh, awareness on those things yeah. um and maybe we can't tr uh, trust twitters but kind of data um and again talking about measuring monitoring you know bre is a mecca of, of where things get measured um, and benchmarks created. Little bit on data sharing and open link data. So, you know, if small developers are to help SMEs in innovating their products, do we need for them just data sharing? Do we need to uh, create a, a transactional, transactional market for data for construction? And in this respect, BRE already has a, you know, a central bank of those, um, or uh, do we need to ask local authorities to just open up their um, data sets, or both? I mean, this is just yeah. really kind of uh, you know high level uh, conversation. The last bit is what's the next step? So it's it's a very straightforward question. If we need to get there, where would you like us to be in six months' time? And you know, in, in 10 years time. So it's a kind of you know, scenario work yeah. really there. So comments, uh, and then you know, we might just uh, kick off. What do, you, what do you guys think? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I suppose from BRE's point of view then, the opportunities bit is one thing that BRE has probably thought, probably not thought of before in terms of that we do a lot of measuring and a lot of, um, measuring of sustainability data, for, for instance, or we do a lot of measuring and testing of products and construction products. Yeah. But actually, one of the things is possibly been that the process has been the important thing. To get there to the certificate has been the important thing, or to get there to the sustainability rating. Whereas actually, one of the things that BRE is beginning to look at is that actually, along that journey of getting there to the sustainability rating, we're collecting a huge amount of data that then we sort of got to a four star or a five star rating mm -hmm. at the end but we actually have something much much more valuable there and um, rather not just the four star or the five star or three star rating so we've got actually a huge body of data there but right now I think BRE's you know, waking up to the idea that that huge body of data can be reused it can be used for different things it could be used to um, make the process much leaner much smarter it could be used to improve the process it could be used just to show how Different area, different parts of the process. For, I'm talking, say, for instance, about brain. Different parts of the process could be integrated with other open data sets or things like that. So that's one of the things BRE have began to begun to look at. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of the pro going back to what I've said about the process, there, the systemic approach. One of the things that I think we're quite keen on, and hopefully we want to do, is to get just to get data out there. So we don't have right now a, our goal, I guess, if you were to say we have a goal, is to make um, parts of BRE's data open so that people can reuse them in other applications. But in terms of what people reuse it for, I think that's the, the really nice bit that we don't know. Mm. And we'll probably be really, really surprised at what somebody uses some of the data for. And that's really good because it's something that we might never have thought of before. So that's what I, is the exciting part of it for us. Yeah. So um, I guess that's BRE's approach maybe. Uh, in terms of a developer community, it would be very nice. One of the ideas we've talked about is the idea that um, around Briam, say we actually get people to write third party apps that are sort of use Briam data or do something with Briam data. Something that, as you maybe said, we in BRE we've got a massive wealth of construction knowledge and of sustainability knowledge but there might not be the pe same people who have that massive wealth of sustainability knowledge might not be like really good app developers or really good um, computer programmers or data scientists but if we can merge that to those two together i think that's where we get the the real sort of value and the real value coming out so we can imagine in years time to have like a hackathon yeah two, two yeah. days no sleeping uh, event um, at BRE, and well, come up with some. I, crazy I, stuff. I mean, one. I think there's there's been nice hackathons that have happened. Um, like for instance, around all the flooding data that was um, from the flooding just uh, last year, around in the south of England. And there's some nice hackathons that happened on that. Just 
giving the data out there and saying, well, you try analysing it and come and think of something that we haven't thought of before. Um, and it's quite, I think that's quite a nice model to, to, yeah. to use. Especially because you might find somebody who actually comes up with something really of value and then from a bigger organisation like BRE's point of view, you could, you've got an immediate partner there who you know who is um, extremely well educated and can find something in your data. And from the partner's point of view, they've got a possibly a, an income stream or some yeah. possible value in partnering up with the, the bigger organisation. And I think that's a nice model because you've got you've got the massive sort of it's the the big sort of traditional big organisations like BRE maybe um, or like so massive construction firms and you have these little the idea of having these smaller satellites round about which are really quick and agile developers yeah. really quick and agile startup type organisations seems a really nice um, way to work absolutely it's a really awfully exciting I mean I, yeah. I may just look forward to that it. it's it's great stuff already there's a there's a strong sense in conversations that the the answer to everything will be um, a, an open hackathon in which we're streaming live sensed data and sort of the future the roll credits you know the end everyone yeah. lives happily ever after and I think this is coming from so many people that there's got to be something in it mm. but at the same time I think it's worth stepping back you know before we before we go there and before everything's rosy and we're all happily um, sort of engaged in this future new world to roll back and say well you know why and how and what else is there in the equation that will truly be needed to, to deliver what we're all hoping for because I don't think it just comes down to open data I don't think it just comes down to uh, better methods of sensing and uh, gathering data remotely and live streams and semantic analysis which I think those are all the, the new and exciting elements on, on, a, on a data journey that we've all been on for quite some time yeah. and, and I think it's worth remembering um, some of the purposes of that journey you know the, the drivers of that journey because you know the best hackathon is one that's led with a question and I think I'm interested to talk about the questions uh, as to why, you know, why we think open is the way forward, and why we would think a relationship between a developer community of software hackers and an SME community um, is is the right way forward, and what else we need to bring along. So, I mean, from my perspective in architecture that the data journey I think is the one to, to start with and say okay uh, in architecture for the last 25 years I think architects and urban planners have been on a data journey that that began with the first computer arriving in the practice and the cynicism and doubt and you know what's this alien thing doing in my office that's used to drawing with ink you know drawing with ink and basing ideas for the future, grand ideas, you know, world changing ideas on best practice, which was basically down to professional opinion, which was down to what you'd learned at college and what you'd learned maybe on a on a few building sites before you then entered your architectural studio and sort of practiced. And so that 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 was and to a degree still is the prevailing sense in one part of our industry in the in the professional design practice. So just going saying well let's have an open hackathon and invite all the architects we've got to remember that they it's only 25 years ago that they were yeah. all in smocks mm -hmm. and and drawing with ink <laughs> and and that attitude has changed you know the, the computer is now fully embedded in the design process as a tool to uh, to draw um, but i think alongside the idea of openness and uh, data streaming i would like to think of the idea of creation being a great opportunity, a great part of a future vision. It may not be specific to the needs of your project, but I think what's going alongside uh, perhaps ideas of open uh, data in the construction industry are the uses of data and computing as generators of ideas rather than as just slaves that, that, that sort of you, you drop all your data into. They're actually the computing digital process is becoming an enabler, a creator of ideas which is really fantastically interesting to, uh, I think not just architects, but 
anybody, any consultant involved in planning and design because you've now got this tool to throw up new possibilities. And that flip from this receiver of your great professional opinion to a partner around the table in terms of, I'm thinking of parametric generative design, yeah. those are all happening ar ar around this general discussion about whether the process should be open or not. And so I think when you are talking to other architects and planners and in the creative industries, um, I would be challenging them around that and to once in one sense and in another just be aware of where they've come from, that they've come from the world of the inky smock and uh, to, to have a, a digital assistant is kind of okay, but to have a digital creative partner I think is a really great new thing. And in a way, it's not something that architects or planners can do alone. You know, the, the, there is an element of, of innovation and research that has to be done in collaboration with, with uh, you know, other professions out there that can help us understand the you know, data set. I mean, the, the data scientists should, should, should become another partner uh, in a design team in, in new plans and projects. And, and I think this is where, in, in the past, to the, the, the best architects work with a team of consultants around a table and you have a you have a say you have a, a discussion and then and then the idea gets formed from all of those yeah. inputs the worst kind of architect say i know it all here's my design you you know show me how to build yeah. it yeah. that's a terrible way of proceeding it still prevails in some parts the best is the integrated approach i think the opportunity to integrate is the massive opportunity that digital brings us and i would sit alongside open as a, a key driver of future development, future innovation throughout the whole of our industry. And, and the more that we can have other people's information on our desktop uh, when they can't perhaps be physically present, or the more that their algorithms can be embedded in our, our algorithms, uh, will create, I think, a richer product at the end of the day. And if those algorithms and the data that drive them are open, then it ought to be a, an accelerated process. Yeah. But I think the open is, 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 is alongside the integrating yeah. aspect of the future. You, I mean, you, also, you, have the, so you have the, I guess, bleeding edge where you have large practices who are really willing to adopt um, sort of new technologies and new practices. But um, just from experience, I've seen that even in, because the construction industry is such a, such a wide spectrum, you've got, um, you've got a, 10 man sort of product manufacturer who makes toilet cubicles who you have to convince to say well the data that you've got about your toilet toilet cubicles can you make that open can you make that available to us and uh, i've seen that could be quite a in a in a similar way but in a, a smaller yeah. scale yeah. that's a, a similar thing to say well it's interesting because your organization is so much bigger than mine i mean we're, we're 20 people and um, uh, i see large organizations having the same problems you've just described as, you know, can you, can you move a bit faster, please? Yeah. I think the difficulty of a conversation like this is we're both at the, at the leading edge, we're just differently yeah. sized. And probably, I think, no matter what the size of the organization, there's, there's a lot of inertia to move that organization forward. You know, the small organization, 10 people, doesn't have the budget to invest in the, you know, the upgrade of the software uh, or whatever is required to move them I on. Think, I a large, think, large yeah. organization might have um, you know, too, ma too many meetings to go through to yeah. make it onto and the it, agenda. And it's also what you said about process as well, and that you've, I mean, the idea of um, saying we'll, we'll use or we'll implement some open data strategies doesn't mean it can be quite disruptive as well because you have something that you say might have been for going for 25 years, and you said actually you're going to do these different, these stages differently, and you're going to do these parts differently now, which can be quite if that's been embedded in an organisation for 25 years and then you say, because you're going to adopt open data, because you're going to let other people use your information and your data, then you're going to have to do all these stages differently and all these things that you've done for the past 25 years and your company is done and they're almost set in stone, you have to change them, yeah. which is can be quite difficult to... to you know, what's appealing about the whole kind of startup hackathon sort of... Um, emphasis and, uh, and allure is, is the fact that you're starting from scratch with something which is small, tiny, easy to find, measurable. Is it yeah. working or not? In a way, the change management of adap adapting big organizations towards a different approach to their business case is, is a much tougher 
um, issue. That, that's where I see that idea of the, the large company working with a small sort of yeah. startup or a small lean mm-hmm. startup being very good because it's almost uh, the, the large sort of company or the large structure um, moving the, what they would term, I guess, is the risky part and moving it into a small lean agile startup who can do things very, very quickly, change it around, try something else really quickly. Um, and they've not got that sort of, they don't have to change the main processes that they're using or working yeah. with. And you don't want to change too much too quickly because it makes commercial sense for there to be a degree of stability in a business. Yeah. But I think having having a part of your business, whether you, whether you subcontract it to another organization or whether you embed it somehow into yeah. your own, and I, I think the more you can embed it, the better because it'll be more directly cultural than it will be to say, well, we've got this other organization yeah. doing it for us that's no matter what scale your organization is to me that's the model of any organization that you have one part of it which is absolutely there to think creatively to take risks and to continuously address what's new out there and evaluate how it could be incorporated into the current business and hackathons and openness and sensing are out there right now. Um, I think every organisation needs to, to be aware of them. And then to say, well, is it me who's going to have to do all the innovation in order to figure out how my business can change? Are, all, all, are there other organisations who can do it better, who can then deliver some product that I can then exploit back into my business. It brings us back to collaboration and, and avoiding you know, duplication of work and, and learning together. And that's key, I think. That's, that's where industry networking matters more than anything, mm. so that you can, you don't have to write your own software, you can, you can just download it because someone else has done it, but you, you're aware of it because of the networking that you do as a business. So even before you have the culture of research, development in your own business, you need the culture of networking. And yeah. I think that then gets you to the subject of openness. It's having that degree of openness of discussion with other organisations, to have an openness of what you're currently doing as a business, and to have the openness to say uh, to someone else, look, I'm prepared to give you this if you're prepared to give you that, give me that in return. That's a, an openness of human to human interface which I think is the foundation of any form of open data platform. So it being one of our aim to improve to increase the data literacy across the entire built environment from universities to to SMEs um, it's interesting for me to hear that you know we need need to go back to people need to go back to networking platform we need to go back to sharing lesson learned and that's that's how you get the message across um you know is that the, the, the way we should pursue or in terms of you know improving and actually measuring the improvement uh, of how the industry becomes data aware um would you think of other ways uh, in which we could uh, pursue this aim well alongside open data you've got open modeling because if, if you want to de-risk the future, it's good to have a model of it. Yeah. It's good to have a model that you can run, whether it's about logistics or whether it's about um, construction sequencing, whether it's about uh, the flows of people through buildings and cities. It, it's good to have a sense of what the future is going to be like with these inputs. And then you can figure, do I need to change the inputs? So in order for you to have those models that can forecast the future, those are then driven on open data, but why not make the model open once you've got it? So it's not just open data, it's open modeling. Yeah. And then you can share the model, and that's you know that's a BIM 3 type yeah. conversation, so we're all working off the same model. I think that change of scenery, if you like, that integrated operational approach will in itself drive an openness because there'll be no other way of of working. Sure, you can close some parts of the model off and just have a little tunnel in and a little tunnel out for your own purposes. But generally, I think the culture will change the more we integrate our modeling platforms as well as our uh, data spreadsheets. And that's exciting. 
and what I like about this is it brings us back to projects you know which is what we do on a, on a you know, day-to-day basis we you know we create buildings and infrastructure mm-hmm. um, and we do that through a process called project um, and that's where we can all learn um, a different way of working and, and I think when we get to site and we can start measuring things um, there is an opportunity for the big guys the, the main contractors um, to share some of their best practice with, with the rest of, of their supply chain. I, is this happening or how can we help that? I th- what you said about this is quite, a, I think it's quite um, interesting because you, you have this idea of, I would say it's almost a flip where actually having closed, uh, a closed pr- process or having sort of um, data that you're not sharing becomes dis- disadvantageous to you because everybody else does it. There's a, there's a sort of, yeah, I, I think there's a, it's a tipping point where actually yeah. it's, it means if you have this closed process that only you work to um, uh, with closed data, then you don't actually start, you don't actually get to join in. So, I mean, you can see that with, see, some um, modern BIM software or, or CAD software where to be able to read models or to be able to look at models, you have to buy into the £10,000 license and a bit of software. Whereas actually, if you can save it as an open format, and you can read it in any bits of software, which actually f- it may not be advantageous to the, the CAD vendor, but to you as a as a, a as an architect or as a construction professional, you can actually share your data with anybody else. They don't need to buy into your system, if you like. Well, the CAD vendor just needs then to change their business model. So rather than sell single licenses, they have to find other ways of generating revenues, so that they are no longer bound to single customers. Uh, they're perhaps more taking revenues to help them drive the research that leads to the next yeah. development of the software. Well, you can also look at the idea that oh, instead of um, selling a specific piece of software, you sell um, you sell a, a recurrent service or you sell a, sell um, a recurrent sort of use of server time, use of algorithms, use of something, um, and it could still be open, but they run them for you. If you look at say some of the or sort of open source vendors like Red Hat and the Linux community. I mean, you can buy, you can pl- or you can get that software for free. But actually, they'll run, manage, install, do all the actual process part for you. Yeah. And that's where they they make their their sort of commission or they make their money from doing it. Yeah. But you can have the, the software for free. You can do whatever you want with it. And commercially, having a cloud based application allows that to be incorporated into the project finance. So for instance, in, in my architectural practice, we use an extremely powerful rendering program, which is entirely cloud-based, and as you say, it's free to download. And, and in each and every project, we can just allow for yeah. the adequate resources. And if, in, in if you have that plan. idea of um, a sort of open data space, where, it, where it's on a, a cloud or a server, you have that idea of the, da- the data there that, as you said, somebody else can come along with a, a smarter, piece of technology or a smarter algorithm that then you can incorporate and then you can manage your data or you can improve the, the quality of the data with that um, or you can look at it in a different yeah. visualized, visual, visualized way so that's that's really good because that's somebody coming along who's maybe not been part of your closed proprietary world before who's got a completely different angle or a different um, algorithm or a different piece of software and then they can actually add value to the process and get paid for it as well I mean it's, it's not they get paid for it as a service or get paid for, for doing it and um, that analysis on your data but it still means you're still working on an open model but it doesn't negate the idea of um, making money from it or, or any sort of commercial part of it yeah, actually in being able to reference users patterns um, with, with individual companies, there is actually an opportunity for more market to be opened up uh, by monitoring those data in a way. If um, Autodesk data on, on what designers design and eventually end up with in the detailed package could be shared, we could see, for instance, um, a designer's aspiration for a certain solution which the market is not able to fulfill and therefore get lost in the process. So in a way, one of the ideas was shared at the RIBA was the opportunity for an open government-led uh, BIM package, mm-hmm. as simple as SketchUp, so that SMEs could learn how to do that. And, but also on the other hand, 
we will collect in data on how SMEs operate in the UK and by monitoring those you know, elements we could I improve their outcome. But I mean you've got the in terms of open I guess open formats for like building information models you have um, the building smart and IFC type formats so you, there are they may not be perfect but I think they're a good a good step forward in terms of being a, a shareable sort of common language between different um, CAD and BIM software packages which I think that's probably the that's been it's a, it's a that's a way out of the proprietary sort of chain um, so you've got another way of of getting the data out and getting it to sort of other packages even if it's just into a spreadsheet or if it's just into something that's just very simple to use and then do analysis from there yeah we here because we believe that um sharing data um being then open or not uh, will allow us to grow the market and and we are also here answering or, or starting an answer to the 2025 report um, which claims a 70 percent overall global uh, growth in the construction market um, i would like to now tap from your experience and, and your portfolio of, of delivered projects um, uh, and plans um, and understanding where do you think growth happening in the next 10-15 years um, at planning level or, or building management and construction level? Well, I was going to start by thinking geographically. Is that what you're interested in? Where in, in the supply chain uh, and where in, in the world indeed. So yeah. it's, it's open and quite high level. Yeah, I, I, I think it's easy to, to start by saying, well, let, let's look to the Far East and let's look to Latin America and but actually, I mean, in the domestic market as well, we're becoming so much more a digitized community at every scale, professional and non-professional, that I think everything that we do will be pervaded with, um, with a, a data-driven approach. And therefore, there will be this very significant need, I think, for, uh, for, for tools at every scale and in every part of the construction industry. Um, my own sector of planning and design uh, will be massively transformed, I believe, especially in the field in between the, the landscape design, public realm design, the urban design, everything that you see in between buildings, the design of streets, which have only partly been digitally designed in the past because they've been run through a traffic model. And the consequences of that have been often very negative for places, uh, safety railing and lines on roads telling you to do this, telling you not to do that, don't go here, go there, lights against you, lights for you. And look at the traffic congestion that they've created. The massive inefficiencies that have been produced by a first attempt to try to model traffic um, are a great opportunity, I think, to say, well, how can we make places flow better? Whether it's adding walking and cycling to the driving mix, but also just being able to drive more efficiently through vehicle control and sequencing and st uh, stacking of cars on roads. That, in terms of the need to develop the software to implement it, it creates one opportunity, but the next kind of opportunity is the consequences of doing that, the greater efficiencies of human behavior that you create. I mean, people get there faster, they get there in a healthier way, you reduce costs on the health industry, you increase the productivity of the workforce. So in lots of different ways, whether it's just the professional need to do the software development or the human social economic benefit that comes from it, um, we can look as far as we like, but we, we, we need look no further than the UK itself to find a very significant market. What I really like about this, and, and sorry to jump in, um, it would allow us to look at public space, not as a risk to men, but an opportunity to, for, for creating new value. And in order to do that, we need to engage with a wider picture of a systemic approach. You, know, you need to, to allow for the NHS savings know well budgeting for a, a cycle a cycling route so you no know, this this is kind of refreshing also from a designer's 
point of view. Yeah. Sorry, Stephen. No, I, I think that's right. If you look at, we'll say, your idea of um, looking at traffic and simulating traffic and using the data from that, I think if you, it goes back to the idea of um, if you've got a, a data set that you can share and you can reuse, if you've got a data set about traffic, the, the variables that affect traffic out with just the data you have on that traffic is, is immense and measurable. You've got data about um, schools and when they open, we've got data about possibly about um, the housing conditions round about and, and unemployment rates because that might affect what's happening with the traffic. You've got data on the, the population and their age and if those data sets are there and are available and you can bring them in, it helps to make that model much richer, it helps to make that model um, much more complete and it helps to find bits that you wouldn't have thought of before. And, and it's a great say, challenge, yeah, it's, it's so a you, great challenge. You may think that you might find something or some strand that actually you never dreamed would affect the traffic in the city and that's why it's um, that's why the congestion happens but you might find that because you can merge these data sets and also I mean going back to the idea of um, construction sector the, the idea that you, you you use and build up all this big body of data as you're creating a building or as you're creating a structure and then it's sort of it's used just in that process of creating the building or it's just using that yeah. construction process actually the the life of the building that that information is extremely extremely valuable and I, I know that that's probably that has been looked at before but it's been looked at to a great extent especially with um, some of the government soft landing strategy where you say actually well maybe we can take from when the building was first thought of by the architect and the client right through to when it was handed over and how it's run, run through an FM system um, and right to the end when actually we're going to deconstruct that building or we're going to actually change the, the, the use of that building so we can use all that information um, to help make that new process better and that's where I suppose the life cycle part of it comes in. And there's, there's um, a reasonable concern that this is incredibly difficult because we're having to take all of these different variables, not just material variables, uh, environmental variables, but social variables and economic ones. And, yeah. you know, goodness me, isn't that just all too much? And I, I'd say, well, no, what a fantastic challenge to, yeah. in the age of algorithms, that, that we should take one of these challenges into the construction industry to say, well, actually, the simplistic models that we've been using don't seem to be working because life is more sophisticated than one or two variables. So if we need to have a few more variables in the model, well, let's develop the model. But from my experience of having developed models, you need to have an integrated data set. You need to have data from all of those different places coming together and being Processed, processed, analyzed, you need to find the correlations within the data to be able to then project into the future. And that effort is a massive effort, but it's a worthy one. And, and it would be one that would have incredible social and economic gains. And perhaps, you know, rather than see the title of the project as open data in construction, I'd like to see it as open data in construction and the constructed environment. So that we don't, as you yeah. as you were saying that we don't stop at the point where we complete yeah. the construction, but actually we see that as just a moment in a continuous sequence of data gathering, modeling. Because as soon as you've finished one, you can absolutely guarantee you're starting the next. Yeah. And a place, if you think about the construction of a place, a place like a town center or a village center or a big city, is a place of continuous construction. At every scale, you know, even the, the little village, there's always someone putting a wall up yeah. or, or digging something. Well, so if you, if you the city's at, just that on a big scale. I mean, if you look at the, the idea that if you can make this construction data available out with the construction industry, um, if, you, if, you're, if I was going to say one of them, say a, a major factor in um, either traffic disruption or population difference is that you make a huge structure or you make a, a new building in a, in a town or in a place or in a housing scheme yeah. and that has a major role on effect for the rest of it so yeah i think one of the greatest opportunities we have there um, is that data will measure our success not only in being able to deliver what the scope of work says but also in in creating a wider sense of value uh, for community and environment uh, and not only uh, in economic sense 
We are responding today to the 2025 report, partially as well, and in that report there is a very specific call for changing the image of construction in order to retain talent um, and bridge the gap in skills. I'm going back to your experience, your portfolio work delivered of happy clients um, and asking you how a data helped you letting your client understand mm -hmm. the value you added. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my question on getting onto transparency really. We um, use a lot of data on how people behave in space, how they flow in a public space, where they sit, who's there, do they look like tourists, do they look like business people, do they look like local residents, uh, are they talking to each other, have they got their backs to each other, and we've built a business around this that's 25 years old, on Thursday of this week actually, and that data is in a way open, you know, we've been able to stand there and observe the world and record it, and we couldn't have built our business without it. We've also then worked with communities and said, would you like to collect your own data? And so they've done surveys door to door, or they've sat in the park and done similar sorts of counts. And you can build up a picture of how the world is. And it's incredibly valuable for many different reasons, for identifying the parts of the town that people don't like to go to because they feel unsafe. You can hand that to the people whose job it is to keep the place safe, to the police force, to the yeah. environmental services to, um, to tidy it up perhaps. Or you can find out which shops are getting more trade than others and that becomes commercially valuable. So in lots of different ways it has, it has value. When people do it for themselves, collect their own data and they, they own it. And then when you present it back to a community, they understand it because you're actually showing them their own life. Now, that's a very direct example of human behavior data, but there are similar opportunities, I believe, elsewhere in the construction industry to say, either collect it yourself, um, which is actually happening more and more. We're not actually having to go out and ask people to do surveys. We're just grabbing data that they've generated themselves because of you know, they've walked through a door and it's pinged a sensor and now that's coming through. It's self-generated. And if people understand that actually they're generating the data, they're not just um, having it thrust at them yeah. uh, by consultants, that's helpful. And that's been my experience, that as far as possible, understand the human inputs to the data that are being generated. And when you can, get your client to directly collect and even analyze their own data. And, and this isn't by any means just a sort of marketing exercise. It, it's a process of creative collaboration where ideas emerge because you as the consultant would have, wouldn't have spotted them on your own. The clients have and said, well, actually, what you've missed is that little cut through the hedge that the kids have knocked yeah. through, but now we will use because it's the fastest yeah. way to the bus stop. <laughs> Great, I would never have got that from an ordnance survey plan. So those little anecdotes build into a body of experience that I think starts to help us understand how, how data is. It's not artificial, it's actually human generated and we can all own and understand it. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the main things BRE does is to look at um, data and look at um, certifying data showing how sustainable a building is because it uses evidence and I think if that data isn't just doesn't just exist through our certification process but if we can enhance that with like as you said maybe um, user generated data you know so our a bream sustainability rating isn't just data that we have or one of our assessors has got evidence for yeah. but if we can enhance that in, in some way maybe from data sets that are already out there or maybe from user generated data, that's a good point, then it's always, it, it just helps in terms of the evidence and the body of evidence that we build up. And it helps us, and it would help BRE to analyze that data more because we can analyze what we collect. Um, but if we can add to that data, there's things that we probably wouldn't have thought of, or as you say, like the, the route through the hedge, yeah. we might never have thought of that. We might never have thought of that some people use um, some parts of 
green just in a different way or they use it just because it's the easiest way to get sort of um, points or credits for that way so actually we can begin to analyze how people use green how, how they do things with it and improve that process yeah i think there are two big ideas under threat that are necessarily under threat and, and the first is the idea of proprietary data you know, this is mine yeah. uh, it's like this is my ball and you're not playing with it, it, it these things are directly analogous and the second idea is authority that authority has vested traditionally in the professional whereas today knowledge because of the increased amount of local user generated data knowledge is being created at a local level and owned yeah. at a local level and individuals have access online to authoritative bodies whether it's wikipedia or whether it's an, an industry they can access by email all of this is undermining the traditional authority of going to the library to get your data going yeah. to your politician to understand the issues going to the uh, the doctor to get a diagnosis and this is a, a this is the, t the nature of the time that we're in that there's this whether it's a sea change or phase change a total reversal or whether it's just a repositioning I don't know but there's something that's been happening for a while that will continue to happen which, which is this change in the way that data is seen and the way that authority is then created and I think as a professional, you have to start to understand that authority is as much at the, at the local level, as much at the low level, as you like, as it is at the high level, and that you have to learn to understand the inputs from both. Yeah, yeah if, if you have your analogy of the ball is, is a good one. It, it goes back to something we talked about earlier in terms of there's this flip where if you, have clo if you do have closed data, then it, at some point it doesn't become valuable because other people can't access it and other people can't use it. Yeah. So I mean, if you've got a ball, you yeah. can't play a game unless other people are there to yeah. play with you. So yeah. if you're not sharing your ball or you're not sharing your data, yeah. then other people can't play, can't do something and then you don't get value out of it either, which I think is, yes. Yeah. I, I see also the um, revolution in the perception of authority um, as potentially a very interesting game changer um, in industry and um, in, in, in the competitive market in a way that, that what ha what's happening here in the consultants authority is sem something similar to what's happening already um, in the intellectual authority. In a way the relationship between visibility and validation has changed, almost kind of flipped upside down. You know, in, in, a, mm. in a former sort of um, system you would need uh, the authority in order to be vi visible. So you need the validation before the visibility. Now everybody can upload their own data and analysis and you know, so the, the, the visibility proves the validation. And this is, is an interesting, I think, process that would allow new, smarter, leaner and agile um, businesses to come up um, you know, if they can prove that what they're saying is, is correct. Um, the possibility of new markets to open up through the use of data kind of brings us to the you know what the, what the risks are um, in in the widespread use of data. So we talked about the opportunities. Now we would like to focus on on you know the diversity uh, of our industry um, and the notorious fragmentation that we've been trying to tackle for about, you know thirty years. Um, we know that uh, in order for a new app or a new service to be uh, measurable, it needs to tackle a very specific issue, and in that. You know, some have already seen an opportunity or a risk really um, for an even more fragmented industry to emerge. You know, I've, I've, I've discovered something interesting by overlapping these two data sets. I have a commercial advantage um, in, in putting out in the market a new app. I'm not going to share that with you. Now, you know, we go, always go back to, to why do we need to share and why do we need to be open about the data sets? And there is that tipping point that you man mentioned earlier. Um, that you know may save us, but I would like to to hear your your take on this. That, I mean that I think though that you become it becomes that you're paying for the skills rather than the access to the knowledge. So that overlap of data, 
Um, you could do it yourself, but you know that there's somebody there who's got a, an application that they've proved works, and you're actually paying for that service. So you could get the data yourself, you could make an app yourself, or you could do that data science part yourself, but you're actually paying for that service, which I think is, is quite a, a good thing. It, it's, it's, shifting the, it's shifting the emphasis on, on making um, profit or making value from something from just I own it, and I have it and that's mine and you get access to it um, through paying me to actually saying well it's open you can have it but actually I'm the best person to ask to analyse this data or I'm the best person to look at this data because I'm an expert in the field so actually it's paying for the expertise and the skill mm. rather than the access and I, I guess that's where I'd see the, the change in value. Yeah. So I think one of the risks to our industry is the changing nature of, for example, patenting, where we've got a highly successful set of industries based on patenting, which has required a degree of closedness until the patent is registered, and then a degree of lack of access to the ideas once the patent is, is out there. Sitting alongside a new kind of business model of openness and sharing, and uh, as you just said, it doesn't mean that it, the traditional professional will disappear. If they become the best person to do the job, yeah. they'll carry on doing the job. It's just there's a mindset change. People are trying to get their heads around new ways of doing business. Yeah. We're seeing so many new businesses come through, though, that take advantage of crowdsourced activity of one kind or the other, whether it's crowdsourced funding or crowdsourced data for... Um, a better understanding of how people flow through places, which is my own benefit of being able to drag multiple data sets generated by lots of people, or crowdsourced house pricing, or crowdsourced flat sharing. You know that these business models are emerging, but we're still in a very unstable market where we haven't established ourselves in the way that the traditional means of doing business have been established over one or two hundred years since the industrial revolution. So the, the, the risk is, do, can we get people to, to a, abandon or evolve from that traditional mindset uh, fast enough uh, to actually create the effort that will really benefit the new kinds of industries going, going forwards? And I think that's where more case studies really matter, to be able to, to say that, yes, it's Kickstarter here and it's, um, you know, I stayed in a nice apartment in Paris at the weekend, but, but I didn't go through any traditional hotel chain to be there. And um, those are the, the Airbnb. new- Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. Airbnb. So. Um, that we need more of those right in our, in our industry, more businesses based on open source data, more businesses who are prepared to uh, give away their technical notes to the benefit of the industry that they're in, not through only philanthropic means, although that might be partly the case, but also because by enabling the market you're in, you raise the value of the market you're in, yeah. which you can then take your share of. Yeah. And that's been our approach as a business. We've made our software open source, not easily, you know, after quite considerable discussion and tension, but we've done it uh, without an adverse impact on the business. We've made our core software available to anyone to hack, and some people have, some people haven't. A lot of people have continued to come back to us because, you know, why do they want to do it? You know, they know that we'll do it. And secondly, we're increasingly making our data sets open to the point of about to open a, an online training platform that will allow people not only to have our open source software, but to really know how to use it. You know, all the instruction manuals and case studies and we want to push them out there because we want to raise the, the quality of the industry that we're in. Why be in an industry where you're the top player uh, but actually the average is dragged down by the quality of the people around you? Much better to be uh, in an industry where the average is higher yeah. and you can still be the top player. Because otherwise the rest of the industry would actually drag you down. You know, either by means of cost or, or, or you know, that's it. There'll always be a, res a resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I think you know, your project needs to find the same sort of um, decision point 
for people to say, actually, we want the industry to be better overall. And, and these techniques will help us do that because if we can all, with the right sort of protocols, and maybe we'll come on to talk about different kinds of openness later because there isn't just one kind of openness, but with the right sort of rules and regulations and protocols and ways of doing business, um, let's share and be open that this, this isn't a, um, a naive, uh, uncommercial way of doing things. It's actually the more commercial, yeah. the more, you know, the cleverer way of doing business. It is the more clever way of doing business, but for many of our colleagues out there, this might sound incredibly scary. You know, as more of our traditional services it does. become and I've seen it. You know, we, we need to ch change our scope of works. You know, I was having yeah. this conversation with a structural engineer who said, you know, I was generally scared at the beginning where you would find on the internet applications that would size a beam for you for free in terms of, you know, seconds. So we, the professionals, the consultants need to understand the sheer scale of change which is going on um, and innovate our products. And I think the project still is, is the best. But it's in the nature of being professional to do that. Yeah. And I think that's where we have to remember that whether it's open or, or you know, if, if, if everybody, you know, if there's a general feeling that, that there should be a particular way of doing things, that as a professional, you interrogate it. That's your responsibility. Your next responsibility is to say, well, um, change is absolutely necessary. So yeah. it's the degree of change, the pace of change, the, you know, the nature of the change. But change is absolutely necessary. And good professionals will remember that this has always been the case. You know, whether it was just about getting their first computer in the business or being online for the first time. Or, and some of us have just forgotten that because it's become second nature. Yeah. So these new challenges come along and we think it's all for the first time. Mm. It's not. It, it, it happens in waves. We should be used to it. And we should be thinking about the next one to be worried about, not the one that we're in. We should accept the one we're in and start worrying about the next yeah, yeah. one because that will be a future unfamiliar territory. I suppose um, getting into the discussion of the meaning of a data you know, literate industry, um, you touched on earlier about the different degrees of, of sharing and openness um, in, in, um, in data sets. And again, going back to uh, BRASP syntax experience, how relevant it is or important it is to um, assess the right degree of openness um, at the beginning of the project and how is that important for the rest of the industry to understand? I mean for BRE um, some of the data that we create uh, can't be open just because it's actually it's the, the property of the client so we measure things that the client uh, has or we, or we look at the sustainability of their building, but we may take uh, readings and measurements which are actually um, confidential. But if we can open up as much as possible, then I, I think that's a very good thing. And I think that's some, that is something we're trying to do, um, even down to being able to encourage, um, in the future, try and encourage the clients to say, well, it's your data, but if you allow us and grant us access to open it, here's the advantages for you. And I, I mean, we've got to show the evidence for that. So that's why we may st we start out s at small scale, if you like, just to put out the data that we have already and try and put that out. But then we can show from using that data or for other, from other people using that data, what the evidence for actually opening up the client specific data is. So. I, th I think we need to look at the copyright. We need to look at uh, licensing to use and we need to look at ownership and they're all slightly they're each slightly different so you know I can own the data but I can give you a license to use the data and we can define the terms on which that license um, takes place it's either uh, as open for your own use in any way that you like or I restrict it to say non-commercial uses or commercial uses within this sector but not competing on these grounds. That's all yeah. in the realms of the possible. But I think we need to, to see how ownership and, and then copyright, you know, the, that um, 
you might own the data, but but I'm the creator of the data, and uh, I'll be acknowledged as the person yeah. having 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 had that creative contribution. Different people will have a different concern as to whether they actually want to be the owner with all the responsibilities that go with that or non if you just lock it up or whether they just want to be acknowledged as the creator as having had the person to been the person to come up with the idea or generate the data in the first place right now in, in software you have a lot of the creative commons flavors of licenses so you have like you said you can have, have creative commons by attribution if you like where somebody is free to use your data but they must acknowledge somewhere that that's data originated from you they can, there is Creative Commons licenses where you can take the data and you can change it if you like and you can add to it, you can um, enhance it or you can use it in a different way. Whereas there's Creative Commons licenses which say this data set has to stay or this software has to stay as it is. You can't change the code, but you're free to look at it, to use it. But I think that's, like you say, as long as there's a, a definite sort of scheme in place where you know what happens when you put your data out there. Like it's not just a free for all. It, yeah. If, you, if you want your data out there, but but it's data that's very specific. You don't want people changing the, the rating of a building or you don't want changing people changing the dimensions of, of some data that you put out there. Then you can put that out under a con Creative Commons license or some form of license. I think taking an action for you know, G4C and BRE, um, I would see a um, pretty well-defined and self-contained exercise there. Um, in finding a common language that could be shared with the rest of the industry from, from the top to the um, smaller players. Um, and through that you know, piece of documentation, being sure that we all talk the same language, that's something that we, we will do uh, for the next um, six, 12 months. So moving on to our last question for today, um, let's get on some kind of scenario work um, going. We have 2025 um, as the uh, deadline where we're going to uh, deliver something, the industry we, we currently lead um, and work in to the next generation. But in the meanwhile, we need some you know, milestones, um, intermediate and interim, uh, to make sure that we are on the right path. Um, so working um, within the data, um, you know, cultural shift, what would you like to see in place in the, in the next six and 12 months to make sure that part of all um, the topics that we tackle today um, will be um, acted upon? Um, I think I would, I would like to see a lot more involvement of non-construction professions in construction. And I don't I mean by that just that the influence or, or the activity in construction from software or software houses or data scientists um, to be able to put in ideas in place because I think one of the nice things by 2025 I would say is that while there's a, a clear roadmap I think along the way I think that roadmap will become hugely enhanced because there will be something that comes up which we haven't thought about or that it hasn't we haven't even had an idea about I think that's the really exciting part I mean I, for me I, I think that the the most fundamental thing is just to um, possibly not worry about um, doing something with somebody else's data, but just put what data you have out there. So even if it's just a small, small chunk, try and put it out and then it, maybe nobody will use it, but hopefully somebody will try and use it, somebody will do something with it, and then that will spark off um, a little idea. It might help to prove in your company or in your organisation why it's useful to do that. But a minimal amount of work just to put something out there, so be it the smallest data set you have or the smallest bit of open data, I think that would be a really good starting point. That's brilliant. I think Stuart's idea is a great one. That to find a, a challenge that could be addressed in six to 12 months <coughs> uh, or a series of them where you could say, let's bring some people together uh, and ask them to come with their data put them in a room together for half a day, a day, and see what they come up with. It's a process that is um, used in planning and design called an inquiry by design. You bring lots of people together and uh, unusual people together, not the usual suspects, but you, you bring in representatives from as wide a community as possible. And by the end of 
by the end of the day you've got something unheard of. So this would be doing it in a more data-driven way. Now, you would need that to be facilitated, I think, by people who have competence in data. Because, as you say, data science is, is a very important, new, evolving discipline. And alongside the uh, M&E engineer, the contractor, the architect, the planner, the traditional s people around the table, to have a data scientist there may not be unusual in a few years. Yeah. Uh, and will probably certainly be begin how the process begins because that sort of skill isn't necessarily going to be embedded in those individual professionals to begin with, if ever. Um, so just as professionals have to have an awareness of each other's skills, then uh, you still want someone else who's really competent at doing that really special thing. I think it'll probably be the case with data science. So try and find a few, bring them along, get them in, get them in the room. But I think the other, th the other side of this is t in the next six to 12 months to be able to paint a picture of 2025 of how the UK and how the world are going to be in 2025. So the challenges and with them the opportunities of population growth, uh, whether it's here in the UK or elsewhere, are making profound uh, have profound implications for the future of the construction industry. You know, we have to house people. We have to create places of employment for people. We have to solve the problem of congestion, which is crippling certain industries for much of the time. And those, we can't just let things carry on as they are. So that does suggest some fundamental shift in how places are put together and then managed once built we can't just leave them behind so I think if you could get a sense that this is first of all a big challenge and with massive risks if it isn't solved but also if it is solved it has the most fantastic opportunities for living health culture innovation the spirit of a place all the things that we cherish from history that we regret when we can't find them in the present could be part of, of the future, but only if we change the way that yeah. we're doing things at the moment. And that actually there's a massive, there's a massive goal there. And uh, if we can change the tools that we work with, change the processes that we use those tools in, take advantage of the digital, then there's a big prize. So on this uh, closing note, we want to remind ourselves that you know, data on its own um, has no value uh, without people um, having ideals and ideas on how to, to use it. So I, on this, go back to the drawing board um, and get ready for the next interview session. Thanks for being with us. Thank, Thank you. Thanks.